uh, yes. hearing for you. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes of course. I, I think this, this is, uh, this feels very much like an in-person meeting where we troubleshoot things together. So I am very pleased to talk to you today about the global potential, but also touch on some obstacles so we can achieve kidney health, which is the major mission of the ISN. So I have chosen some key elements to discuss in the few minutes that we will have. And I've listed those on the slide here. First, we have to identify those with kidney disease. We have to increase awareness about our kidneys and that is a major role of World Kidney Day. I will also talk a little bit about how we train health professionals and diagnose the disease process. And as I'm a renal pathologist, I'm not going to venture at all to talk about how we can implement appropriate treatments. So World Kidney Day this year was the 11th of March and we had a huge impact in terms of the number of people reached on Twitter, the impressions, the likes, the comments, the press releases. And Latin America was a big active participant for World Kidney Day. There were 790 events reported, many countries participating. And I realized that people can be very competitive across the world, particularly maybe for some areas in Latin America when it comes to proper football or soccer as we call it in the US. So look at this, Brazil wins with the biggest number of events, but maybe they have the biggest population there. Argentina and Mexico also had many events. Let's look a little bit about the ISN members in this part of the world. North America and the Caribbean have the biggest total number of me members, but Oceania and Southeast Asia also have many members, Western Europe, other parts of Asia, but Latin America has a robust membership from many countries, as you can see in the pie chart over on the right. So the ISN has collective member societies in Latin America that are very productive and useful ways to communicate and create bridges and to aim for improving our capacity to teach and reach out and do better with kidney health. These include the collective societies with the Brazilian society, Colombia, Guatemala, Panama, Paraguay, and Peru. So, how do we achieve expertly trained health professionals so that once we have increased awareness, everybody knows about their kidneys, people know GFR is something that relates to kidney, creatinine is something that we measure. Well, we have to have collaborations with cross-training both from high and low middle income countries and also within countries, within the regions that have centers that are more developed and those that do not. We have to have infrastructure, and this has to be sustainable. We cannot have a one-way giving from a high income to a low income in perpetuity. It is not sustainable. So there has to be an ongoing local excellence centers, regional centers that can build on the knowledge that is gained and spread it locally. So building capacity in Latin America, there is a lot going on and some of it relates very much to collaborations with ISN. There are two regional training centers in Colombia and Guatemala. There are interventional nephrology training centers in Mexico and in Peru. 146 fellows from Latin America have been supported with help from the IESM, 48 in the last 10 years, 28 in the last five years. So we're keeping up or even increasing our pace slightly. And we even have nine fellows who trained within Latin America within the last five years. We also have had clinical research projects coming from the collaboration between local societies and ISN, 10 in the last 10 years and four in the last five years. We also have a very strong regional boards and I'm very delighted to welcome the latest members from the Latin America regional board leaders, Dr. Madero and Dr. Sano Martins, who are chair and deputy chair for the regional board for Latin America and will be key part of ISN Council as we work together to achieve our goals. We also have a big investment of the Sister Renal Center program. These are most in Africa, fewer in South Asia, closely followed by Latin America and with fewer regional centers in areas of the world that are more developed. So the centers from Latin America have been extraordinarily successful. You can see some of the pictures of some of the groups that have worked together. We have graduated six centers from Latin America, from Argentina, Bolivia, two from Colombia, from Mexico, and Guatemala with partnerships that have been very successful. And these centers now are poised 
to be able to be regional centers of excellence and to be able to overcome obstacles regionally and have more training happen within the region. The active sister centers within Latin America, seven of them, we have two that are at level A, one level B, two at level C, and then we have sister transplant center pairings that have just emerged with Colombia and Argentina. So what is the potential that we can even further beyond this to be able to achieve improved kidney health? I'm very excited that under Vivek Jha's leadership, he and Sharu Malik, our executive director, had a wonderful visit to ISN SLAN several years ago, and a memorandum of understanding was developed to work together for development of nephrology in the region. Under the aegis of this MOU and with the ongoing collaboration, there has been an online scientific writing course co-hosted by SLAN in Latin America that was held over Zoom it turns out that despite the challenges we have with COVID-19, we also have opportunity and we've learned to work virtually much more effectively. There were 10 participants and the feedback was very productive and very positive. We've also had webinars on ISN Academy and over the last decade or so, there've been over 75 CME meetings supported to build capacity and increase knowledge and increase the ability to do research and to communicate about that research. What are some of the obstacles? Well, I, I'm sure this is not news to you. There are workload challenges. Once we identify patients by increased awareness, increased screening, there are so many patients when we reach all of those who need to be reached and there are too few health professionals. There are challenges of infrastructure beyond awareness. How do we screen? How do we have access to patients to reach them for screening? And then I will focus a bit on challenge of access to specific diagnostics. They obviously include imaging, they include other ancillary specialties, but renal pathology for many diseases is one key element for specific diagnosis for optimal course of treatment and prognosis for the patient. So some of the ways that we have worked together to overcome obstacles is through the educational ambassador training program. And you can see some of these leaders who have been educational ambassadors. This was a brilliant step by the ISN leaders at the time to go beyond the seminars, workshops for maybe a day or two or three with leaders from very expert centers coming in and giving a few lectures for a day or two and then disappearing. Even though that has a very positive impact, it doesn't quite lay the foundation for proper training, identifying obstacles and providing hands-on further communication and training to be able to work further. So the educational ambassador programs has great potential to give short-term intense on-site training with advice for clinical areas. It may include research. The advice can include allied personnel that can travel and come to the center to be part of the training and then followed up from that educational ambassador timeline, which can be up to a month with ongoing mentoring and virtual interactions. So the challenges are to maintain the support and build on the initial visit to be able to implement those things that are suggested from that visit. So to make that happen, it's really essential to have institutional support. And that's been a key element for consideration and evaluation of the educational ambassadors who've applied that the programs that are applying, the centers that are applying have that institutional support. And we have to train people beyond the MDs. I am sure you know that even though you're a brilliant nephrologist, some of you maybe are other ancillary personnel, renal pathologists, you cannot do it all. You need to have the additional personnel trained and part of your team. So the educational ambassador program was put on hold because of COVID-19. Obviously we can't go in person and travel when there's a pandemic, but we will, Bring this back after the pandemic. It has a duration up to four weeks. The focus of the program has been on dialysis, either hemo or peritoneal, acute or chronic, interventional nephrology, renal pathology, and transplantation. The scope of the visit has been either to improve existing services or to build a program from scratch. If you're building a program from scratch, it really is imperative that we have ongoing training required it's not enough to come in one time and tell everybody everything to do to build the foundation from scratch, you have to follow up. 
And this has been made possible with, for instance, an ISN fellowship after an initial educational ambassador to a training center in Rwanda for the local pathologist to train in the US and then go back. And now after that success, the Rwanda Center is planning to apply for sister renal center program. So I wanna give you some examples of educational ambassador program shared with me by Vanessa Bijol, who was invited to be a leader in this area and write about it by Vivek Jha. So one of the programs that Dr. Bijol was involved with was in Georgia in 2018. There was an existing program and the goal was to improve capacity of this program. So they first had a plan. They evaluated the current state of the renal pathology laboratory, looking at histology, immunofluorescence, and electron microscopy, evaluating the processing equipment, the workflow, the procedure manuals, the techniques, everything technical. Then after doing that evaluation, there was an assessment and review of current deficiencies and a plan to troubleshoot and identify the areas that there could be on-hand, on-site, hands-on training. Then that was followed by the hands-on training with handling of biopsies, frozen section technique, IF technique, EM processing. And then comes the next step, review of the cases and interpretation, integrating these materials. So here's a picture with Dr. Bijol shown over on the left side with part of the team in Georgia. Here you can see some of the inspection of equipment, looking at how tissues process. They even had an electron microscope, so they weren't at a primitive state already. And here you can see some of the innovative solutions. Instead of giving a very expensive camera, a small little attachment to a microscope with a smartphone can take pictures of images to share for teaching, for conferences, for documentation. Innovative, low budget solutions to achieve communications and further education. So here is the final visit from that. Another setting was much more challenging, Rwanda. It really takes a village to build a program from scratch. Here the ISN provided support for a whole team, nephrology, radiology, a pathology histotechnician, and the renal pathologist, Dr. Vanessa Bijol. So they wanted to develop an integrated program with nephrology and radiology to be able to do biopsies and develop light microscopy and IF services as a starting point. And also develop local renal pathology expertise. As I told you, the outcome was the next step of training of a renal pathologist through the ISN fellowship program and an expert renal laboratory in Boston. So here are some of the initial visits, looking at the biopsy procedure with radiology, looking at the expert with Vanessa Bijol, Michael here looking at the microscope, taking pictures, looking at a cryostat on the left, tissue processing, practicing techniques, and bringing together, there was ongoing support for the time of the pathologist in Rwanda. But some of the obstacles that have happened is that time pressures may increase and the leadership at the institution has to recognize that taking on renal pathology doesn't mean a tiny hobby that the nephrologist or the renal pathologist adds to their existing workload, there has to be additional workforce implements to be able to handle the workload. And we have found that reagents in some developing countries are exorbitantly expensive, maybe tenfold more expensive than in developed countries. And I'm very pleased to learn with my collaborations with the president of the Renal Pathology Society, Dr. Parmjeet Randawa at University of Pittsburgh, that the RPS is working now with pharma and with other contacts to try to source reagents in as a gift or at very low cost for low and middle income countries to collaborate and build on some of the programs for the ISN and the International Working Group of the RPS. So let me tell you a couple of more examples of things that have been tangential to the ISN but built on the model of the ISN. This is a tale of progress and challenges from Tanzania and my very good friend, Dr. Einar Svarsta and Dr. Bjarne Iversen from Norway. The goal was to set up kidney biopsy expertise in Tanzania. A junior dedicated nephrologist was identified, Dr. Francis Furia, who did a sabbatical in Bergen, and there was hands-on intensive training in many elements, including getting a biopsy. This was built very much on the sister center ideas and educational ambassador, the funds came from this, not from the ISN, but from the Norwegian government program with a two-year graduate program with collaboration with centers in India, collaborating with Bergen and the University of 
Health and Allied Sciences in Tanzania. There was funding for seven consecutive years from the Norwegian government, and then all training became self-sustained at MUHAS with support from the ministry and social welfare as they do for other postgraduate medical training programs. And this has been published in British Medical uh, Journal for Nephrology and Kidney International. So based on in part this advocacy, this, these efforts led to the establishment of Nephrology Society in 2012 in Tanzania that became the following year affiliated with ISN, Interactions with World Kidney Day, Ministry of Health Interactions, and increased screening for kidney health, diabetes, and hypertension, an ongoing CME for doctors, nurses, and others, and an ISN fellowship program participation that includes local training. The initial training program of those seven years had seven trainees, six completed, all returned to their home country regions after being trained in Velour, India, or in Bergen. The ongoing program has been able to sustain training with three nephrologists trained each year, and the nephrologists have increased from one to the latest numbers I have, 14 in 2018, over a decade or so. The dialysis units have increased from one to 28 units a few years ago. Maintenance hemodialysis have gone up nearly tenfold, funded by the National Health Insurance Fund, which unfortunately only covers about 7% of the population with ambitious plans to try to expand that. Acute PD has been added and kidney biopsies from zero, there are now over 300 done within the center and transplants have also more than quadrupled. So what are the obstacles then? The renal biopsy procedure skill was acquired and equipment was donated from the University of Bergen, Herculon Hospital, but that machine is now not functioning which means that they currently are doing the biopsies that are needed by old fashioned physical examination. Expertise is needed to process and interpret the biopsy. And although the initial pathologist who was trained did a terrific job, the work pressure and the problems of income and support led that person to leave to go into private practice. And there is a big need for expertise needed to process the biopsy with training of histotechnologists they are improving the light microscopy. Immunofluorescence is in infancy stages and EM is not set up. So there still are obstacles and room to improve. And there's expertise needed to interpret the biopsy. The first pathologist that I mentioned was trained in Bergen. Now over hundred biopsies have been performed but the protected time remains an obstacle and a challenge because of the remuneration and the huge pressure for pathology in other areas like cancer diagnosis and other diseases. So it's not a workable model to just add new complex tasks for existing personnel. We have to avoid burnout of those that we train and support and there has to be departmental institutional support. So my recent communications with Dr. Furia indicates there's an urgent need for increased nephrology training and we hope that this will be something where ISN can partner and can identify suitable people that can benefit and follow through with this training. So what about other parts of the world? Let's go back to Latin America, from Georgia, from Africa, to Chile. Dr. Daniel Carpio, a pathologist in Chile, received startup funds from the Renal Pathology Working Group Initiative when I was chair of the Renal Pathology, then called committee, for two years of funding that was supposed to be for implementing further development of renal pathology services with a program that was at a starting point. He had very strong departmental and university support. So what happened from that investment? It wasn't so much money, it was $10,000, but they were able to implement new techniques in kidney biopsies, to buy new medical and computer equipment to be able to do biopsies better, to train a medical technologist, to have Dr. Carpio have a short stay under the mentorship of Dr. Charles Jeanette at University of North Carolina, to train further two Argentinian pathologists, and now to have outreach to four other universities for training and support for other nephrologists and pathologists. They have increased tremendously the volume of kidney biopsies that can be done and are doing them now at an expert level, over a 500% increase over the last two decades now over 800 per year just in Valdivia, which does about 80% of the biopsies in Chile. 
So important elements of the success of this program is that it was self-sustaining after the initial startup period, funded through insurance, through usual health mechanisms. There has been communications with the Ministry of Health in Chile for guidance, but not direct funding from the ministry. Currently, these are the nephropathologists in Chile. You can see Dr. Carpio has been the leader and the pioneer in this area, but he has five other colleagues that together are being able to provide increased renal pathology services, one element of achieving better kidney health. So what are Dr. Carpio's plans going forward and what are the challenges? Particularly in pandemic times and because of the large distances, it is very useful to have centers for the processing interpretation, but his plan is to obtain a slide scanner so that in real time, slides can be shared in real time meetings for teaching education. He also wants to develop the pipeline and this is so important. We need both young nephrologists and renal pathologists to be excited and supported and enabled to enter the arena of kidney care for optimal future results. So how can we develop the next leaders? This brings me to the ISN Emerging Leaders Program, a program that was envisioned and initiated and implemented by Dr. Vivek Jha, our most recent past president of the ISN. The ISN ELP provides early career professionals in integrated kidney areas the opportunity to work with international experts. They will become qualified for a leadership role in the advancement of kidney care. We had a wonderful cohort of applicants from across the world and 14 participants were chosen. And I'm very pleased to tell you that Dr. Kelis Silva from Brazil is a member of the inaugural cohort. She received her MD only 15, 16 years ago, completed nephrology training 10 years ago, followed by a PhD. She was the recipient of an ISN fellowship and then a clinical research grant and has ongoing engagement with ISN activities. Leaders like her, both for nephrology and for renal pathology will enable us to overcome the obstacles that we face in many parts of the world. So in conclusion, we have huge challenges across the world that there is a large potential for us to continue to do more good. We can recognize the large burden of kidney disease by increasing awareness and increasing advocacy, and we can build capacity for all elements of kidney care. All of these goals need our best energy and resources for sustained improvement in detection, treatment, and ultimately prevention of kidney disease. I give you the information about the ISN, I'm sure you already know. And lastly, I want to thank those who helped me put together the material for this talk to give your perspective on potential and obstacles for kidney health. The key staff at ISN and my renal pathology and nephrology colleagues who shared information about their experiences with me. Thank you very much for your attention. Continuamos con la plenaria conjunta SLAN ISN, la salud renal y la próxima pandemia. ¿Cómo debemos responder al cambio ambiental por Vivekanand ya de India? Good afternoon, my dear friends. Let me start by thanking the scientific program committee of the SLAN Congress uh, in Canada uh, City. This is, there is a, my friend Alejandro a small delay inviting me between to talk you to and what is happening via the platform. So virtual this platform. moment is just uh, I would have finished. liked so nothing in, better than uh, to be with you uh, in person the, during this Congress. The conference but unfortunately, that we was, are living uh, in COVID. really abnormal I think that you will be which is to related to the topic the that the uh, committee has maybe, given me to speak on. So let me get straight into it. Uh, my topic is uh, inspired really by the pandemic. Yeah. And okay. Discuss something about climate change and how it is impacting the kidneys. And what should be our response? Yeah. Well, so let's we will be begin our discussion about the, the relationship the between the coronavirus CEO and climate change. change. There is a very strong school of thought that believes that 
it is the climate change that is largely responsible for the release of coronavirus in, into humans and onset of this pandemic. Although this remains in some dispute with the lab leak theory still being investigated, but I think none of us will dispute the fact that we are going through an unprecedented period where deforestation is taking place around the world, which is link, leading to destruction of natural habitat of animals and other, uh, other beings. They have nowhere else to go, but to come to a place where they come in increasing contact with human beings, and that increasing contact can lead to unpredictable consequences, including jumping of uh, pathogens, which normally infect animals to humans, which is one of the hypotheses of uh, the genesis of this COVID pandemic. So deforestation is just one of the many things that is contributing to what is called climate change. And in simple terms, it is defined as a global phenomenon which is characterized by changes in the usual climate of the planet, both in, in, in terms of temperature, in terms of precipitation, in terms of wind, and in terms of other factors. And importantly, it is believed that these are specially caused by human activities. And this is, last bit is hotly disputed with many people not necessarily agreeing to it, but I think the balance is sticking more and more in favor of uh, that idea. Climate change indeed has been dubbed as the greatest public health challenge in the 21st century by a number of organizations, including the World Health Organization. So let's look at the various major threats to global health from climate change. And here are a few of them. Climate change has been thought to be responsible, at least in part, to changing disease patterns that we're seeing around us, to water and food insecurity, it is contributing to air pollution. It has been really very directly linked to extreme climatic events. And as a result, the population displacement that takes place. This graph from the Our World in Data website is really self-explanatory. It describes the number of global reported natural disasters, overall numbers, and broken down by different types. And you can see that the biggest contributions is are made by floods and extreme weather, uh, followed by drought, extreme temperature, earthquakes, and so on and so forth. It's quite obvious that the, both the number and the variety of these natural disasters has been increasing over the last 50 years or so with rapid acceleration over the last 20 years. Before we get to kidney disease, let's just have a high level overview of the impact of climate change on non-communicable diseases and see what are the possible pathways and their outcomes. So climate change is postulated to produce health impact both directly and through a number of indirect impacts by altering the socio environmental and social factors. Direct impact is because of injury directly and, and death post-event traumatic stress and increasing disease risk, which we'll talk more about in a few moments. Indirectly, it can lead to a number of specific events which are shown here in the blue box, which has a number of secondary outcomes, such as change in the availability of fresh water and increase in food prices and reduction in food availability. It also leads to alteration in microbial ecology and increases physical hazards. All of these together lead to these indirect health impacts shown in the red box, uh, which has impact on hygiene, nutrition, mental health problems, infectious disease risks, and of course, depression that may take place after any such event has occurred. Many of these things also have non-health impacts such as due to conflicts and displacements, people get had to relocate, and that has also indirect health impacts. Now let's come to our own specialty, which is of kidney disease. What are the main types of kidney disease that have been attributed or can be attributed to climate change? So the first one in this list is heat-related kidney diseases. Kidney diseases related to changing biodiversity and those that results from extreme weather events. Data 
over the last 70 years or so has shown very clearly that both the number of heat wave days and the longest duration of heat wave in a particular year in terms of uh, the days has been increasing slowly over a period of time. The solid black line shows the average uh, for the world and the different colored lines indicate the heat wave days and the duration of heat wave in different regions of the world. Heat can lead to acute kidney injury, it can lead to chronic kidney disease, and it can also increase the risk of developing kidney stones. And that is shown here in the summary slides of the relationship between daily maximum temperature and mean hospital inpatient renal admissions in Australia uh, from July 1, 2003 to 31 March 2014. They looked at all the admissions between the months of October and March in a hospital in Adelaide and plotted them on, on the x-axis, you have mean uh, the maximum temperatures and on the y-axis, you have mean daily admissions. And these are the indications for those admissions are shown here in different slides. All kidney diseases, kidney failure, stones, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, urinary tract infection, lower urinary tract infection and pyelonephritis. And the trend is unmistakable that as the temperature goes up, the risk for admission for all of these conditions increases. So then what are the mechanisms of heat stress induced kidney injury? It's something that is obvious to us, but still worth recapitulating that heat stress, overexertion, and water shortage, when they come together, they increase the risk of rhabdomyolysis, uh, apologies for the typo. They also cause increase in osmolality. They lead to hyperthermia and volume depletion. And altogether, it causes kidney injury. That kidney injury can be as a direct result because of all of those insults due to vasopressin activation, alteration in the aldose reductase system, uric acid crystal urea leading to blockage of the renal tubules and hypokalemia, which also causes renal vasoconstriction. Finally, reduced blood flow because of hypovolemia, all of these lead to acute kidney injury. And once again, the same slide that you had seen before of the increase in number of disasters and these disasters are being seen now around the world. This is a picture taken from the massive rains that we had recently in the large city of Chennai in Southern India. This has become all too frequent a feature now. Almost every year we have a few such episodes of heavy rainfall that really disrupts life in a mega city like Chennai. What does it do? A combination of flooding, hot and humid environment is really conducive to the growth of disease causing vectors like mosquitoes and ticks, and also the disease causing parasites like malaria shown here on the left side and a dengue virus looks beautiful, but it can cause a lot of misery. And when often you see water staying because it cannot evaporate because of high humidity for long and becomes breeding ground for these mosquitoes and ticks, etc. It's really not infrequent at all for there to be a large number of patients who present with acute febrile illness associated with acute kidney injury to hospitals in tropical countries. And this clinical picture can vary a lot. In addition to fever, there might be jaundice, there might be thrombocytopenia, liver injury, respiratory distress syndrome, uh, etc. And all of these clinical combinations of clinical symptoms and signs lead themselves to a list of differential diagnoses, uh, which need to be then uh, further broken down and parsed uh, using specific tests, which are not always available, especially in the low resource parts of various tropical countries. Now let's come to kidney stones. It's again obvious that heat related setting causes a reduction in urine volume, when the urine volume is reduced, there is urinary supersaturation both in the renal tubules, distal tubules, and also in the collecting system, which leads to precipitation of various 
crystals and generation and propagation of kidney stones. Now there is uh, sufficient ecological data from different parts of the world. Here on the left, you see data from United States where an increase in mean temperature from 10 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius was associated with almost 40% increase in stone risk. And this is data from Korea where a daily temperature 13 degrees and 29 degrees uh, were associated with a two and a half times jump in the increase in stone risk. And here you can see that these are really mild temperatures. And may, in many tropical countries, the temperatures go up in the 30s and 40s, and in rare instances, even in the 50s. So you, you can imagine what will be the stone risk in those parts of the world. Now, moving on to the other type of kidney disease, which has been implicated, uh, you know, uh, to be related to heat. And this is something that I don't have to tell you a lot about because chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology was really described for the first time in your part of the world. You know, here is Panama and uh, this CKD of uncertain etiology was described in uh, many countries that are very, very close to Panama. Uh, and as a result, it has received the, uh, the eponym uh, Mesoamerican nephropathy. But over the course of last 20 years or so, uh, the extent of geographic areas in which this disease is identified has now grown. And uh, many other parts of the world have also started reporting uh, chronic kidney disease, which is at least superficially similar to that was reported in the Central American region. And you can see the various countries from where uh, such chronic kidney disease clusters have now been reported. And a lot of research is underway to try and understand the cause of uh, this chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology. But I think there is a general consensus that heat is right in the middle of uh, all of this. Because if you map the different uh, countries of the world where all 12 months have high mean temperatures uh, around the year, uh, you know, and you can see the colors in, in, in this. And similarly, if you map the world by the extent of global water scarcity, which is also related to heat, and you can see the colors here, it is not very difficult to really uh, realize that these various parts of the world seem to be overlapping uh, with the areas from where chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology is being reported. And this is going to get worse because it is now projected that by the year 2025, which is not, for a, not too far away, more than half the, of the world population will reside in water stressed areas. Dr. Rick Johnson and his colleagues uh, who have been working in this area for, for a long, long time uh, presented the schema in their paper in CJASM uh, five years ago of the possible link between heat stress, water shortage and over exertion and uh, chronic interstitial fibrosis, which is thought to be the main uh, histopathology behind chronic kidney disease of uncertain etiology. And they propose that it is really repeated episodes of acute kidney injury, which culminates into chronic interstitial nephritis, which seems entirely possible. Now, moving on to the next consequence of climate change, which is human infections. That's not something which we as nephrologists have thought a lot about, but then there is compelling data to show that there is a lot of interaction between the various components of climate change, which can eventually lead to increase in infection diseases, uh, such as uh, ectoparasite zoonosis, and so increased fecal oral transmission of infections, and so on and so forth. If you look at the history of pandemics, which has received renewed attention in the last two years, you will see that uh, five of the major pandemics that are that have been described in the history have occurred in the last 20 years and we are really living through the worst one of them of uh, of, of the last 100 years uh, which is covid-19 even before all all of these pandemics came this paper which was published uh, now uh, 6 or 7 years ago showed that the number of disease uh, number of infectious outbreaks as shown here in the uh, red line, and the number of infectious outbreaks that leads to disease has been increasing over the last 60 or 70 years. 
and you can see that this uh, increase has accelerated in the last 20 years or so. I won't talk too much about COVID-19 because I'm sure there will be other people covering COVID-19 and various aspects of kidney health in this Congress. But I think it is suffice to say that chronic kidney disease and organ transplantation increase the risk of death in COVID-19. This is data from just one such paper. We showed that reduced kidney function and organ transplantation were one of the most uh, important risk factors for uh, increased risk of mortality in COVID-19. COVID-19 is also associated with acute kidney injury, which wasn't realized initially in the reports that came out of China, but as the pandemic moved to Western Europe and North America, uh, it became obvious that a significant proportion of people who are getting hospitalized due to COVID-19 were developing acute kidney injury. And even more frequent were other urinary abnormalities such as proteinuria and hematuria. Acute kidney injury was an important negative prognostic variable. It overwhelmed available resources. And we still don't know what are going to be the long-term consequences of people who had acute kidney injury due to COVID-19 and have recovered. And it should remain an area that we need to study more. The next point with climate change is asking the question, who are the people most vulnerable with, from the effect of climate change? And this graph shows you the extent of vulnerability. And again, you might imagine that the more red a country is colored, the worse it is in terms of vulnerability. You can see large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa is vulnerable, many parts of South Asia and Southeast Asia, and many parts of Central and South America are highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change as well. Additionally, there are a few population segments which are vulnerable, even in countries that are not so low resource, quote unquote, and these are the children, the elderly, those who have pre-existing chronic kidney disease, people who have to work outdoors, uh, manual laborers, construction workers, agricultural workers, those who take uh, medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, angiotensin blockers, diuretics, and SGLT2 inhibitors. And those, unfortunately, who might have reduced access to healthcare uh, because of a number of socio-environmental factors uh, that might prevail in those countries. This is one such example of a figure that was published in Kidney International a few years ago of uh, of an earth, following an earthquake in uh, Kashmir in Pakistan, uh, where a dialysis patient is being evacuated from an earthquake uh, affected region to a city where this person can get dialysis. And you can see uh, that this person has been put on a cart and has to be manually carried through this highly, highly uh, treacherous terrain uh, during an earthquake. We also reported uh, the impact that was faced by patients with COVID-19 uh, who had pre-existing chronic kidney diseases, in particular those who were on dialysis. And this was uh, the report uh, from the first wave of COVID-19 in India. And this was even worse in the second wave, where unfortunately many people who were on dialysis uh, suffered and even died in some instances uh, because of difficulty in accessing care, including dialysis. So the question has to be, what can we do about it? And there are a number of things that have been postulated. You know, some of them are shown in this uh, particular slide, upgrade light bulbs, hang dry clothes rather than use a dryer, recycle, uh, wash clothes in cold water, uh, replace your typical car with a hybrid car, eat a plant-based diet, switch electric cars to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, uh, to fuel -free car, from fuel-free car to electric car, uh, avoid a large a long flights, live car free, have one fewer child and so on. Some of them are easy enough to adopt, others not so much. Now, the question is uh, that the, what can we do as a society? So there are two sets of actions that have been proposed to build climate resilience in the world. They are divided into mitigation, which are actions to reduce emissions that cause climate change and adaptation, which are actions that will manage the risks of climate change impacts. So this is to prevent development of climate change, and this is to manage uh, the risks that climate change will have on health after it has developed. There are a few actions that, of course, overlap between mitigation and adaptation. 
they're shown here uh, in the two circles with, with the overlapping circles here. And I won't go into the details of these. You can, uh, you can stare at it and, and you can see. Now, it's important to point out that they don't have to be in separate bubbles. And I, I would like to point out just the two kidney specific, what are called co-benefits of mitigation strategies. So switching from fat, uh, from a meat-based diet like burgers to plant-based diets will have a positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions uh, by switching from animal-based diet to plant-based diets. But we also know that plant-based diets have a good impact on kidney health as well. So not only does it have mitigation impact on climate change, but also has direct positive impact on kidney health. Similarly, moving from public transport or motorized vehicular transport to the more active transport, such as walking or cycling, uh, will help in uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and therefore uh, help reduce climate change, but also has direct beneficial impact on kidney health. Uh, that, that's something that is well known that exercise uh, leads to reduced risk of uh, progression of chronic kidney disease and, and many other uh, non communicable diseases. In addition to all of this, nephrologists have a direct role in mitigation as well. This is something which has been discussed and I'm, I, I'm sure that this is, it will be discussed during this Congress also, the concept of green nephrology. So what is this green nephrology? The green nephrology is really for us as a community to think about reducing clinical waste during dialysis. This paper uh, has shown that Dialysis units are one of the most uh, most wasteful uh, parts of the hospital so far as generation of chemical waste is concerned. And you have the numbers here in hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And taken together, uh, this study showed that hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis are responsible for almost one third of uh, total clinical waste generated in the United Kingdom. There are disposal issues. We have to incinerate them, which is associated with, uh, associated with emissions. There is cost to disposal and uh, disposal of uh, PVC results in release of toxic chemicals. And we can actually incorporate a number of reduction strategies, which would start from segregation of waste, recycling of packaging where appropriate and substitution of hazardous materials uh, with non-hazardous materials in particular, removal of PVC products. There are a number of other kidney-specific adaptation strategies, and some of them are listed here. We should promote behavior change. We should implement preventive measures to promote kidney health. We should monitor kidney functions more in vulnerable groups. Uh, we should implement measures uh, which will reduce uh, the risk of heat-related kidney injuries, such as increasing hydration and heat stress reduction, such as uh, giving shade breaks to people who work outdoors in hot and humid climates, maybe limiting working hours and enforce strict work rest ratios, and enforcing water quality standards uh, where the quality of water is uh, sus suspicious. There are a number of other things that we cannot take, for example, use of uh, mosquito nets uh, to reduce malaria transmission, use of long sleeve clothing for by agricultural workers to reduce exposure to pesticides and vector control by using rat traps and, uh, and, uh, and use of other vector elimination strategies. Maybe uh, safe storage of food, which will prevent uh, vectors from coming in and uh, making their homes here. There are a number of things that the international nephrology community is doing. For example, the International Society of Nephrology, Pediatric Nephrology Association, EuroPD and ISPD has been running this program called Saving Your Lives which is uh, aimed at reducing uh, the number of uh, preventable deaths due to acute kidney injury, especially in children, through resource sensitive strategies, such as using acute peritoneal dialysis, uh, which is perhaps the only form of kidney replacement therapy that might be available in remote rural areas of parts of Africa, South America, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. We need more research and we need more funding for research on climate change. We also need more advocacy. It is really uh, useful to note that a number of uh, uh, common lay groups, uh, including lay press, is recognizing the impact of uh, climate change on, on kidneys. 
we need to make them our allies and we need to involve them in our research, in our uh, direct advocacy in outreach programs to various governments and funding agencies so that we can, uh, we can make sure that we do our best to minimize the impact of kidney health in patients who are at risk of or who already have kidney disease. So therefore, in conclusion, uh, my dear friends, I hope I have been able to convince you that climate change is really a very important public health challenge. It has both direct and indirect implications on kidney health and kidney diseases. Kidney care will be directly affected by climate change, especially uh, dialysis care and so on. Low resource countries and vulnerable groups in high resource countries are at highest risk of, uh, uh, of the climate change and its impact on kidney disease. Climate change mitigation strategies will produce kidney health co-benefits. Kidney specific adaptation strategies will be needed to minimize the impact of climate change on kidney health. And in the end, we need more collaboration, we need more research, we need more funding, and we need more advocacy. With that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Seguimos en la plenaria conjunta SLAN ISN, retos de futuro para la nefrología latinoamericana, conectando políticas públicas y atención renal, compartido con el paciente, por Alejandro Ferreiro de Uruguay. Hola, buenas tardes a todos y todas, comunidad nefrológica de América Latina y el Caribe es para mí un honor poder participar en este congreso y en este simposio en particular. Eh, mi nombre es Alejandro Ferreiro, soy eh, docente de la Universidad de la República de Uruguay, actual presidente de la Sociedad Latinoamericana de Nefrología e Hipertensión. No tengo conflictos de interés para eh, declarar. Eh, vamos a establecer algunos pasos que nos va a llevar al análisis de cuáles son los eh, retos de la nefrología latinoamericana para los próximos tiempos y iniciaremos con una hoja de ruta donde eh, evaluaremos cuál es el diagnóstico actual de situación, cuáles son los determinantes de la enfermedad renal en Latinoamérica, la comunidad nefrológica y su rol y cuál va a ser nuestro rol en la pospandemia. Nosotros sabemos que en el momento actual en América Latina probablemente cerca de 60 millones de personas eh, padecen de enfermedad renal crónica. Esta información surge de la extrapolación de datos de la encuesta de, eh, nacional eh, de salud de Argentina realizada en 2018-2019 que encontró que el 12,7% de la población adulta presenta esta enfermedad. Cuando extrapolamos estos datos a los diferentes países de la región SLAN, podemos estimar justamente que cerca de 60 millones de personas, de los 650 millones de habitantes, eh, tienen algún grado de enfermedad renal crónica. Por otro lado, la enfermedad renal crónica es sabido que en América Latina tiene una enorme tasa de mortalidad y dentro de nuestra región es la segunda causa de pérdida de años de vida. Eh, cuando eh, miramos el fin del camino, que es aquellos pacientes que alcanzan la enfermedad renal extrema y requieren tratamiento sustitutivo renal con diálisis o trasplante, y es de quienes tenemos datos, porque no tenemos datos de las personas que optan por el tratamiento conservador, sabemos que al momento actual, según datos del registro latinoamericano de diálisis y trasplante, más de medio millón de personas reciben este tratamiento, llegando a una eh, prevalencia en el año 2019 de 840 por millón de población, como va a ser mostrado en este congreso. Esto nos muestra que en los últimos 10 años, 150.000 personas adquirieron la posibilidad de, eh, de, requerir, de recibir tratamiento de diálisis o trasplante en la región, lo cual realmente es un éxito rotundo. Pero mirando eh, el medio vaso vacío podemos ver que existen grandes inequidades en el acceso y en la prevalencia al tratamiento de renal sustitutivo en los diferentes países de la región. Y cuando vemos este panorama podemos llegar a inferir que probablemente cerca de 230.000 personas que podrían haber estado o haber recibido tratamiento renal sustitutivo no lo han recibido y probablemente hayan perdido la vida. 
Otra forma de mirar el problema es centrándonos en los aspectos de la incidencia del tratamiento renal sustitutivo por países. Según datos también del Registro Latinoamericano de Diálisis y Trasplante, eh, de incidencia de 2018 o 2019, se ve que en muchos lugares para los pacientes con enfermedad renal crónica el fin del camino no es luminoso, sino que es un fin de camino oscuro. Y no sabemos exactamente cuántas personas eh, no alcanzan el tratamiento y por lo tanto fallecen. Pero cuando vamos a poner el foco y mirar específicamente en aspectos que tienen que ver con el mejor tratamiento para los pacientes, como es el trasplante renal, también vemos que en la región hubo enormes avances en los últimos años, llegando en el momento actual a una tasa de trasplante de 22 eh, pacientes por millón de población. Pero también aquí las inequidades entre los países son muy importantes, muy marcadas, desde países que prácticamente no tienen programas de trasplante a países como Jalisco, Uruguay o Argentina, que tienen tasas que están por arriba de los objetivos. Es así que como primer diagnóstico podemos decir que existe una profunda inequidad en la administración de tratamiento renal sustitutivo en nuestra región. Pero cuando queremos eh, profundizar en cuáles son los aspectos de estas inequidades y cuáles son los determinantes de la enfermedad renal latinoamérica, vale la pena repasar eh, el modelo multinivel de determinantes de la enfermedad renal. Este modelo que aplica perfectamente en la región tiene como centro al paciente, a los pacientes, a las personas con sus factores biológicos y su caudal genético, algunos determinantes más próximos como son los factores individuales y las preferencias del estilo de vida o las influencias comunitarias y el soporte social más cercano y otros determinantes más distales de la eh, relación salud-enfermedad como es el acceso a los servicios de atención a la salud, las condiciones de vida y de trabajo o las condiciones generales socioeconómicas, culturales y ambientales del país o región donde el paciente habita. Centrándonos en los aspectos más proximales, en América Latina existe un aumento muy importante en los últimos años de la prevalencia de los factores de riesgo de enfermedad renal crónica, de la hipertensión, de la diabetes, la obesidad, de las enfermedades transmisibles, pero particularmente la diabetes y, y obesidad que en algunos países tiene características de catástrofe sanitaria. Además, la región tiene unas características particulares, como la presencia de otros factores de riesgo, llamamos no tradicionales, para el inicio o la evolución de la enfermedad renal crónica, como es el bajo peso al nacer, el bajo nivel educativo y económico, las minorías racial y étnica, otros factores que inician la enfermedad, como la toxicidad por drogas, eh, la alta frecuencia de injuria renal aguda, la infección urinaria o la obstrucción urinaria que no está correctamente eh, resuelta en muchos lugares. Esto probablemente determina una alta carga de enfermedad para la enfermedad renal crónica en la región. Si nos centramos en los determinantes más distales que tienen que ver con el acceso a los sistemas de salud, las condiciones de vida y las condiciones socioeconómicas, vemos que en este entorno América Latina también presenta grandes diferencias y grandes debes por resolver. En primer lugar, si nos centramos en las políticas públicas de salud y la organización del sistema de salud, vale recordar que en el caso de las enfermedades crónicas como la enfermedad eh, renal, eh, la población general presenta en algunos de sus individuos factores de riesgo que ya mencionábamos, tradicionales y no tradicionales, y son esos pacientes que debemos diagnosticar en la medida que la enfermedad renal muchas veces es eh, asintomática durante largos periodos. Una vez que se hace el diagnóstico, el paciente ingresa al proceso de atención a la salud y en el sistema de salud donde se establecen diferentes estrategias de diagnóstico y tratamiento. Tanto el screening, la promoción, el diagnóstico, el tratamiento y los costos indirectos del manejo de la enfermedad constituyen los costos del manejo de la enfermedad. Y lo que buscamos a través del programa de atención a la salud, del sistema de salud renal, es la mejoría de los resultados. Resultados que en este caso son disminuir la progresión de la enfermedad renal crónica, disminuir la tasa de necesidad de reemplazo renal o tratamiento sustitutivo renal, disminuir los eventos cardiovasculares y la muerte acelerada asociada a la enfermedad renal crónica y mejorar la calidad de vida. 
Y aquí es donde podemos evaluar la efectividad de los programas y el impacto que tiene sobre los pacientes. Uno de los problemas que tenemos es que la mayoría de la información que tenemos en la región y fuera de la región tienen que ver sobre todo con indicadores que podemos medir fácilmente, que están en el área de la estadística cuantitativa, este, que ha generado muchísima información, pero que no eh, condice tanto de pronto con los objetivos centrados en el paciente como son particularmente la calidad de vida, como veremos más adelante. Para que un sistema de atención a la salud renal funcione, requiere recursos humanos calificados, nefrólogos, enfermeros, asistentes sociales. Y en este caso también vemos que en la región existen grandes variabilidades en cuanto a la disponibilidad de recursos humanos calificados que de alguna forma pueden comprometer la atención de los pacientes con enfermedad renal crónica. Este eh, número de nefrólogos se asocia directamente con la prevalencia de enfermedad renal crónica y es un indicador clave del desarrollo de los sistemas de atención renal en los diferentes países. Por lo tanto, si nosotros queremos mejorar las inequidades que existen entre los diferentes países y regiones, seguramente habrá que poner el foco en la formación de recursos humanos en el futuro para promover el desarrollo de los diferentes programas. Independientemente de esto, ya hay muchas políticas públicas exitosas en la región con un beneficio directo o indirecto sobre la enfermedad renal crónica, su inicio, su progresión. Algunos países han desarrollado políticas públicas exitosas en la lucha antitabaco que tienen su repercusión también en la salud general de la población, en la mortalidad cardiovascular, pero también en la progresión de la enfermedad renal crónica de aquellos pacientes que la padecen. La iniciativa Hertz de la Organización Panamericana de la Salud para las Américas, que tiene como principal objetivo el control de la presión arterial y la disminución de los eventos cardiovasculares, sin duda que impactan en la población eh, con enfermedad renal. Y ni que hablar aquellos programas de salud renal que en algunos países ya están llegando casi a los 20 años de instalado y que son referencia a nivel mundial de qué y cómo hacer para diagnosticar y manejar nuestros pacientes en las primeras etapas de la enfermedad. Pero existen otros factores del entorno que impactan en el desarrollo de la enfermedad renal crónica y uno de ellos es el acceso al sistema de salud. Y esto es extremadamente importante porque mirando desde la perspectiva del paciente, los pacientes transitan en el sistema de salud por diferentes niveles de complejidad y probablemente con diferentes instituciones que son prestadores del servicio de salud. Complejizan su acceso al sistema de salud, complejizan al tratamiento oportuno de la enfermedad y se corre el riesgo que el proceso asistencial se fragmente con consecuencias que son nefastas para el paciente, pero también para el sistema y para sus familias. Eh, para que los pacientes sean atendidos por los servicios de salud, existen diferentes condiciones que tienen que estar de alguna forma coordinadas y trabajando en sinergia. Factores que son económicos, también organizativos, también geográficos y ni que hablar que los aspectos culturales que pueden impactar en este acceso. Si evaluamos cuál es la cobertura de tratamiento renal sustitutivo en los países según el ingreso de los países, según datos del Banco Mundial, vemos que en aquellos países de ingreso medio-bajo, menos del 50% de los pacientes tienen cobertura de tratamiento sustitutivo renal. Por otro lado, en aquellos pacientes de ingreso alto, la totalidad de los pacientes tienen más del 75% de acceso al tratamiento sustitutivo renal. Por lo tanto, queda claro que las diferencias en el bienestar público, en los indicadores macroeconómicos, impactan fuertemente en el desarrollo de los programas de atención a la enfermedad renal crónica en todas sus etapas. Pero aquí hay un aspecto a tener en cuenta. En aquellos países, sobre todo los que tienen menos recursos, existen otras partes interesadas que están pujando en esa carrera por poder contar con los recursos que son escasos para, en forma totalmente... Eh, segura y certera, poder resolver otros problemas. Es el programa de salud renal compitiendo con el programa de salud cardiovascular, pero también compitiendo con los programas de desarrollo social, la educación, la infraestructura. Por lo tanto, debemos aprender a posicionarnos y manejarnos en ese contexto 
poder hablar con las diferentes partes interesadas para de alguna forma conseguir los recursos que nuestros pacientes requieren. Y no cabe ninguna duda que el desarrollo de los programas de sustitución renal en el mundo, pero también en América Latina, están directamente relacionados al Producto Bruto Interno de los países. Aquellos países que tienen mayor tasa de prevalencia en reemplazo renal son los que tienen mayor Producto Bruto Interno y que han mantenido el Producto Bruto Interno durante más tiempo. Y tenemos ejemplos paradigmáticos en la región en los cuales una caída brusca del Producto Bruto Interno se asoció a una disminución drástica e inmediata del acceso de los pacientes a terapia sustitutiva renal. Por lo tanto, nuestro segundo diagnóstico es que existe una profunda asimetría en los determinantes del proceso salud de enfermedad renal en nuestro continente. Si ponemos un ejemplo paradigmático de lo que eh, ocurre en cuanto a estos determinantes múltiples del proceso salud de enfermedad en nuestra región, tenemos que remontarnos a 20 años atrás, cuando en un hospital del Salvador, por primera vez se puso la atención sobre una enfermedad renal de alta prevalencia que afectaba a los individuos jóvenes y cuya causa no era claramente establecida. Esto, llamada enfermedad renal mesoamericana, enfermedad renal crónica eh, no tradicional, CKDU, o sea, de causa desconocida, después eh, ha sido replicado como modelo en otras partes del mundo. Y de, es determinante por sí mismo de una muy alta tasa de eventos cardiovasculares y mortalidad en algunos de los países de Centroamérica, pero también en algunos otros clústeres en el resto del continente. Las causas de esta enfermedad probable son múltiples, pero claramente asocian aspectos que son propios del paciente, propios de sus factores de riesgo, del bajo peso al nacer, de la minoría étnica, pero también determinantes laborales de falta de acceso a los sistemas de salud, pobre inversión en los sistemas de salud. Entonces el modelo multicausal de enfermedad renal crónica en algunos lugares de América Latina tiene su máxima expresión, donde la asociación de prácticas laborales inseguras, exposición a tóxicos en un ambiente cálido, como claramente es nuestro próximo reto, eh, determina diferentes mecanismos por los cuales esta enfermedad es de alta prevalencia en la región en Centroamérica, pero también, como ya refería, en algunos clústeres en Brasil, en el norte de Argentina, probablemente en el norte de Perú, y también se ha demostrado, por ejemplo, en algunos de los estados de Estados Unidos. Por otro lado, ¿qué sabemos de injuria renal aguda en América Latina? Y bueno, la injuria renal aguda es la gran olvidada, sabemos muy poco. De datos obtenidos también del grupo de injuria renal aguda de la Sociedad Latinoamericana de Nefrología y de grupos eh, que han trabajado en, dif en diferentes sociedades nacionales, sabemos hoy que probablemente la tasa de casos de injuria renal aguda que requiere diálisis, también según datos de Argentina, ronda alrededor de los 200 casos por millón de población. Una mortalidad que es cercana al 30% pero también con tratamiento que es de escasa calidad en muchos casos, según datos que hemos obtenido del registro de enfermedad renal aguda de la sociedad. El 40% de los casos son de adquisición comunitaria, entonces aquí hay un área enorme para trabajar, y hasta 20% de los casos son manejados fuera del hospital y muchas veces por no nefrólogos y la mayoría de estos pacientes tiene escasísimo seguimiento. Por lo cual aquí queda claro que es necesario trabajar en el futuro, seguir trabajando con los médicos de primer contacto, que son los, aquellos que hacen diagnóstico y manejan la mayoría de los episodios de enfermedad renal aguda en la región. Y por otro lado, ¿qué sabemos de las preferencias de los pacientes en América Latina? Mucho menos aún. Si nosotros volvemos al esquema de lo que es un programa de atención a la salud, eh, como política pública, sabemos que la efectividad de los mismos debería medirse pensando en la calidad de vida de los pacientes, en las preferencias de los pacientes. Lamentablemente, este tipo de análisis escasea, y escasea porque quizás sean dificultosos, desde el punto de vista estadístico, tenemos que manejarnos muchas veces con estadística cualitativa, pero es el gran debe de la nefrología mundial 
y a nivel regional. Se han hecho enormes avances en los últimos años, el grupo Song ha trabajado mucho en esta área y bueno, eh, parece ser que es una perspectiva que tenemos que tener en cuenta. Porque la visión de la paciente y sus preferencias pueden ser muy diferentes a la del médico que realiza la investigación, al médico que utiliza indicadores subrogados para definir cuáles son los objetivos de tratamiento. El objetivo del paciente es tener la mejor calidad de vida posible por el mayor tiempo posible. Y en la medida de lo posible con la menor cantidad y severidad de repercusiones adversas. Esa fórmula, tiempo por calidad, es la fórmula que tenemos que nosotros tratar de mejorar. Mayor tiempo con mayor calidad de vida. Y sobre esto cayó COVID. Cayó COVID de una forma inesperada que claramente impactó fuertemente en toda nuestra estructura social, en toda nuestra estructura de atención de la enfermedad renal, en los programas que estaban en marcha, en nuestros planes, entre nos, nuestros planes familiares, entre nuestros planes personales. Y sin duda que tuvo su impacto, del cual no voy a profundizar en la medida que está ampliamente desarrollado en otras áreas de este Congreso. Pero lo que es sí seguro, que COVID vuelve a mostrar las inequidades que existen en América Latina. Siendo América Latina el continente que en el momento actual tiene la mayor cantidad de casos, muestra enormes inequidades en el acceso a la vacunación de la población con algunos eh, países que recién están iniciando a vacunar a la población general ni hablemos a la población con enfermedad renal crónica. Entonces, en este contexto, ¿cuál es el rol que la comunidad nefrológica debe llevar adelante? Y bueno, la comunidad nefrológica está como el medio, es como el jugador del mediocampo, que por un lado tiene que eh, interpretar los requerimientos de los pacientes que están dentro del sistema de salud atendiéndose en un binomio entre el usuario y el efector de salud para subir y retroalimentar esa información a quienes toman decisiones en las políticas de salud, quienes bajarán sus eh, conceptos, sus lineamientos que deberemos interpretar y ejecutar, pero ¿cómo? Siempre con la mejor evidencia centrada en el paciente y siempre interpretando el entorno para establecer las mejores estrategias. Es así que trabajando fuertemente con la Organización Panamericana de la Salud, desde el ANSE han hecho enormes logros, como es trabajar hacia la cobertura universal de del tratamiento de la enfermedad renal crónica, alcanzando un pro una prevalencia promedio de 700 pacientes por millón de población, el desarrollo de las técnicas de trasplante y diálisis peritoneal como mejores técnicas costo-efectivas, aumentar el número de nefrólogos y trabajar sobre el problema de la enfermedad renal crónica de las comunidades agrícolas, pero siempre pensando en el beneficio de los pacientes. Y COVID nos ha enseñado que tenemos que transformar las crisis en oportunidades, las debilidades en fortalezas y las amenazas y desafíos. Y claramente la comunidad nefrológica latinoamericana esto lo ha aprendido y lo ha utilizado en este año y medio. Ha habido enormes avances en lo que tiene que ver en el compromiso social de los nefrólogos, en el conocimiento de las organizaciones, en el acercamiento a las autoridades eh, gubernamentales, pero también a los pacientes. Y hemos desarrollado conjuntamente recomendaciones para el manejo de pacientes portadores de la enfermedad renal. Hemos hecho actividades conjuntas con la Organización Panamericana de la Salud para que ésta eh, planteara a los ministerios de salud que la enfermedad renal crónica debía ser priorizada en el momento de administrar las vacunas y así muchas otras cosas. Entonces, en este contexto nosotros podemos decir ¿qué es el futuro? ¿Cuál será el futuro de la nefrología post pandemia? Y bueno, lo primero que quisiera poner la atención es que no podemos perder el foco. No podemos poder perder el foco en qué? En nuestros 650 millones de habitantes, con 60 millones de pacientes con enfermedad renal crónica estadio 1 o 4, más de medio millón de pacientes recibiendo reemplazo renal, pero en un contexto de una gran heterogeneidad de indicadores socioeconómicos y de distribución de la riqueza. Es así que tenemos que aprender a trabajar en conjunto, en forma coordinada, entre los diferentes países, las diferentes sociedades con los decisores de la toma de decisiones en salud, con los pacientes, para cerrar los eh, agujeros que tenemos en la carga de enfermedad en América Latina. Debemos trabajar para 
mejorar la evidencia centrada en las preferencias del paciente, interpretar el entorno para establecer las mejores estrategias, de forma de beneficiar eh, a ese binomio del usuario con el efector final del sistema de salud y mejorar las políticas de salud. Es así que el nefrólogo latinoamericano en los próximos tiempos tendrá que mejorar sus eh, capacidades de liderazgo, trabajar en la normalización nacional e institucional, mejorar los aspectos de la asistencia, sobre todo incorporando en los avances de la telenefrología, mejorar hacia la educación, innovación, investigación en el primer nivel de atención, formar recursos humanos, mejorar la abogacía y proyectarse hacia el futuro. Y también tenemos que trabajar mucho más integradamente en el manejo de la enfermedad renal, de la enfermedad renal aguda, de la injuria renal aguda, de la enfermedad renal crónica y del tratamiento sustitutivo renal como un conjunto de diferentes manifestaciones de la enfermedad renal que están interrelacionadas entre sí. Es así que junto con la Organización Panamericana de la Salud definimos nuestros objetivos de trabajo para los próximos tres años que estarán centrados fundamentalmente en consolidar la capacidad técnica de los registros nacionales de pacientes en tratamiento sustitutivo, el desarrollo de estrategias educativas para la capacitación en salud renal y limitar el impacto sanitario de COVID-19 en la población que tiene enfermedad renal crónica aguda, no solo de la enfermedad, sino también del post-COVID. Es así que junto con OPS trabajaremos en fortalecer el liderazgo regional con los diferentes ministerios de salud para mantener los sistemas de información y promover la implementación del proyecto de telenefrología. Pero esto no se hace si no fortalecemos nuestros registros. Se viene trabajando fuertemente ya hace muchos años en el desarrollo y fortalecimiento de los registros de salud renal, pero esto debe seguir adelante, no solo centrarse en la enfermedad renal crónica que requiere tratamiento de sustitución renal, sino también en la enfermedad renal crónica en los estadios más precoces y en la enfermedad renal aguda. Porque tener información es tener poder, es tener capacidad de planificar, de poder dialogar con los tomadores de decisión y después de analizar cuáles son los resultados de las medidas que se toman. La Carta de Ottawa de hace ya muchos años establecía que el sector sanitario no puede por sí mismo proporcionar las condiciones previas ni asegurar las perspectivas favorables para la salud. Que la promoción de la salud exige la participación activa de todos los implicados, los gobiernos, sectores sanitarios, los sectores sociales, económicos, la sociedad y los medios de comunicación, pero también de los pacientes. Es así que deberemos poner el foco en todos estos aspectos, en los profesionales de la salud, en los tomadores de decisiones, en los pacientes, juntamente con los nefrólogos. Y están dadas las condiciones. Como siempre decimos, las crisis son oportunidades. Y en esta época de crisis de la pandemia COVID, hemos fortalecido nuestros lazos con los ministerios de salud y con la Organización Panamericana de la Salud, con la Sociedad de Enfermería en Nefrología, con la Asociación Latinoamericana de Pacientes en Nefrología, con diferentes gobiernos para el desarrollo de registros y particularmente con el gobierno argentino y con las grandes organizaciones supranacionales de nefrología que de alguna forma estamos participando en el mismo camino. Por lo tanto, resta mucho por hacer, pero las bases ya están consolidadas. Podremos trabajar juntos, junto con nuestros pacientes, para lograr nuestro objetivo común, que siempre va a ser la mejora de la calidad de vida de los pacientes que asistimos, en un contexto de un sistema de salud equitativo, saludable y de alguna forma permitiendo el desarrollo de nuestros países para la salud de nuestros hijos y quienes seguirán más adelante. Así que caminemos juntos, ese es el desafío y espero que sigan disfrutando este congreso que sin duda contribuirá a lograr construir juntos este camino para encontrarnos. Yes, I am waiting the end of the lecture of Alejandro. So, there's a small delay between what we are seeing here in the platform and what is happening. So you can begin now if you want. 
then thank you Alejandro and uh, welcome everybody to this session. This is a session to exchange, to give opinions, to ask questions. I am Juan Fernandez uh, in Montevideo, Uruguay. I am a former president of SLAN. And first of all, I want to thank our speakers for such motivating presentations. Although we are far away, each in their city, I feel we are very close, sharing this room and sharing the, the worries, the expectancies about the future of the nephrology in the world and particularly in our region. We have here uh, to help us our, our guests, Agnes in Nashville, Tennessee. How are you, Agnes? Fine, thank you. Okay. And Vivek in New Delhi, India. How are you, Vivek? Very well, Juan. Can thank you. you. Okay. And Alejandro in Montevideo. Can you hear me, Alejandro? Yes, of course. So we have good communication. Some technical problems have been overcome and now we are very well communicated. This is time then for exchange questions and comments. And we have some questions from the attendees but also I encourage you, feel free to uh, make questions among yourself, like in a round table. This is exactly a round table. And then I have uh, questions from the attendees. Let me see the questions. And the first question is for you, Agnes is for, from Jorge, uh, sorry, from Oscar Novoa. Oscar Novoa asks, how can ISN support relations between Latin American centers with complementary capacities? We need to build equilibrated relationships. I suppose Oscar is thinking about the South to South relationship that uh, was very strong in the past between different Latin American centers and supported by ISM. Agnes? Yes, thank you for this excellent question. So I think this really gets to the heart of what ISN is trying to do instead of having, oh, let's say a center in North America and Europe and a center halfway across the world that needs a partner to now, as we have emerging centers of excellence in different parts of the world, to have local regional interactions and that they are not so hierarchical and horizontally organized, but also having vertical integration of the information, the capacity that we have within a region. And we have regional centers. I mentioned a couple of them within my talk, the regional centers of training that we have in Colombia and in Guatemala, sponsored and supported in part by the ISN, and the interventional nephrology training in Mexico and Peru. I think that the memo of understanding that Vivek maybe can speak to even more since he was the leader of the ISN when it was signed with SLAN and ISN will help us to build on that further because it's not a sustainable model to have centers across the world be the ongoing focal points. Once a certain expertise and capacity has been developed, it is within your region that you will reinvigorate yourself to continue to learn, to build, and to teach and employ each other. So I think that these are the ways that ISN will move forward is to have more emphasis on rings in the water, regional interactions, and not everything coming from remote places in very high income countries in uh, Europe, uh, North America, to other parts of the world, but within regions. 
But Vivek, I would love to have your comments too, since you were uh, the leader of making this wonderful interaction and the memo of understanding coming in place with SLAN and ISN. Well, thank Thanks, you. Yes, I think you've covered it well. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is that if we encourage more regional cooperation, we also cut down on the long haul flights and uh, oh, yeah. contribute to climate change mitigation. Well, that will certainly, in view of Yvette's talk, that should have a big impact on kidney disease. If we can decrease our carbon footprint, we can do a little bit to change uh, climate. And also, it makes it more feasible to have more frequent ongoing interactions if it doesn't involve super long travel. But I do think that that should be complemented with in-person interactions because the in-person interactions build up an additional element to the networking understanding and dynamics. So I think it's useful to have ongoing mentorship and virtual interactions be complementary to in-person interactions. Thank you. Um, there is a comment and a question by Jorge Serra, also addressed to you, Agnes. Um, and Jorge, she said, in the Caribbean region, there is a working collaborative network for kidney biopsies, which could be reproduced across the South American region, perhaps. That is the question, Agnes. I would agree. I think that the model that we've seen, I gave you an example in Chile, where there are now five other pathologists who interact with the university center that has an electron microscope that is working to get slide scanning. And not every test that's available needs to be fully developed in every place within a region. I'm sure that the same thing happens with complex nephrology patients that they may get referred to centers that have particular expertise or treatment options that you won't have absolutely everything available at every center, but that you will have some things that uh, gravitate to areas both for scale of economy, for technical expertise, for the additional things that are necessary for in particular renal biopsy. And it's not a problem to ship renal biopsies by FedEx or whatever courier, whatever mode to ship them overnight a day or two to get to a central lab and get an expert reading. But it should be complemented with uh, local capacity for doing things that are reasonable to do locally. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, this is a question for Vivek. Uh, it's a question related to chronic renal disease and uh, change uh, the change in the world that uh, you explain it very well. But uh, my question is about the classical, the major causes of chronic kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, glomerulonephritis. Is there any connection between the climate change and these uh, diseases? Thank you Juan, for that excellent question. Uh, for sure there is a connection. So climate change is also contributing to the rise in these risk factors. For example, rise in sea levels has been shown to lead to uh, regression of the highly saline water into uh, the riverine systems and the aquifers, which increases the salt content uh, of, of the food that people eat and the water that they drink, uh, which is leading to increase in the prevalence of hypertension in countries like Bangladesh and coastal India. Uh, it also is increasing the prevalence of preeclampsia in pregnant women. Similarly, uh, reduction in, the, uh, in, in mobility and uh, more reliance on the use of processed foods because people are gravitating away from fresh foods and vegetables is uh, contributing to the rise in obesity and contributing to the rise in diabetes. Combine all of these together with reduction in physical activity, they also contribute to kidney disease. And... Uh, 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 the last bit is about glomerulonephritis. So glomerulonephritis also is now at least uh, in, in the low resource parts of the world uh, where you see still a fair number of infection related glomerular diseases. We are seeing these novel infections and novel presentations of glomerular diseases also, which we need to be uh, watchful for. Even during the COVID pandemic, uh, we are uh, now seeing new forms of glomerular disease being described, which have now been dubbed even 
COVID associated nephropathy and Agnes and many others have uh, described this and published this in, in, in these upcoming journals. So we have to be on the lookout for these interactions which make uh, diagnosis as well as management of various types of kidney disease even more complicated. But I think the good news there is that if we take this all together, then it seems like common mitigating actions uh, would help not only in uh, reduction in burden of one disease, but perhaps multiple diseases. So that, that's a hopeful message there. Thank you, Vivek. Another question for you. This is a question about renal replacement therapy, particularly about chronic hemodialysis in center, considering the, the risk of outbreaks, for example, talking about the COVID pandemic we are suffering in hemodialysis centers and considering the waste of water in patients in chronic hemodialysis, something like 25,000 liter per patient per year. So which is the future of hemodialysis in center in a planet with a scarcity of water and abundance of pandemics? That's a tough one, Juan. And uh, I think the entire nephrology community is grappling with it. We need to do more clearly. So the first thing is to move away from center-based dialysis to home-based dialysis so far as possible. Use peritoneal dialysis. But peritoneal dialysis is not free from uh, its impact on climate change. Uh, it generates, uh, it leads to generation of plastic waste, uh, which we have to then uh, dispose of. So we need to continue to think about it. But what is uh, giving us hope on the horizon are initiatives like the Affordable Dialysis Prize, which the ISN had uh, sponsored six years ago with uh, the George Institute for Global Health, which has actually led to now the uh, uh, development of a novel uh, form of peritoneal dialysis in which uh, people who need peritoneal dialysis have, will be able to have a machine which can allow them to generate peritoneal dialysis fluid at home and fill their banks and thereby drastically reduce the amount of water uh, that is wasted uh, for dialyzing each individual. It will be able to run on solar power, uh, the device, and uh, it has a very low carbon footprint. Uh, I'm pleased to say that it is uh, the prototype is more or less ready and there is group working on it to bring it to clinical trials, hopefully later this year. And if it all pans out as planned, then we, we should see it uh, uh, come to market in the next five years or so. And the second thing is, of course, ongoing uh, research that is taking place around the world uh, with a number of initiatives in US through the Kidney, Health, uh, Kidney X initiative of the American Society of Nephrology, uh, but also independent research groups that are working on miniaturizing uh, the kidney replacement therapy devices and reducing the dependence on what over de dependence on water, uh, development of uh, uh, artificial organs, if it takes place uh, sometime in future, will of course be the ultimate holy grail that we are all looking for. But then there are a number of steps that we can take. One practical step that many countries are taking uh, and, and has, uh, uh, has, has elements that are worth consideration in other parts of the world also is reuse of dialyzers. So uh, each time a filter is used, uh, if, if we can uh, find safe and effective ways of reusing the dialyzer filter, then we can also cut down uh, the amount of plastic waste that each dialysis uh, generates. Okay, thank you, Vivek. I have a question for Alejandro. The question is from Carlos Zuniga from Chile. He, he asked about the role of the patients in the elaboration of the health, renal health policies, Alejandro. Yes, I, I, I think that is a good question. I think that in this time, you know, one hour before this meeting was a joint meeting with CLICOP, that is the Organization of Patients of Latin America. And we were discussing this point of view of the, it's absolutely 
mandatory to include uh, the, the view of the patients, the preference of patients in new guidelines. And uh, we have to share, uh, to, to, fi to find the way to, to share this point of view with the uh, policymakers. Uh, maybe most patients are not allowed to, to reach the policymakers to as to uh, make possible to, to these policymakers to know what they think. But uh, we may promote this point of view to share to, with policymakers, to share it, to put this point of view in our guidelines and uh, to move our practice to a practice more uh, related to the preference of patients as is now being done in, in our community. Thank you, Alejandro. Do you want to make some comment, Agnes, about patients and renal policies or Vivek? Well, I was very, very pleased through the ISN to be contacted by the American Association of Kidney Patients and be allowed to address them. And I am very happy that the ISN is working on developing a patient uh, liaison group that will help to advise us. One of the other initiatives that we have in the mid-level planning stage to have a new initiative for translational nephrology will also have patient input. So I think that in addition, we have the importance of having to listen to patients, also to communicate with patients. I I'd like to hear Vivek's a view on this since obviously he deals with patients much more directly than I do. Thank you very much. And I have a question for Alejandro. Uh, it's a question about the relationship between SLAN and the Pan American Health Organization. SLAN have been uh, in a very good relationship during the last 10 years with a uh, Pan American Health Organizations. I would like some word from you about the, the summary of that, the benefits of that relationship. And I know yeah. that in past weeks, that uh, relationships has been renovated. Why are your expectancies uh, well, for the future? Well, it's my it's my my point of view, but uh, you know, SLAN is uh, an association that last year uh, was uh, now is fifty years living in South America. But I think that after the the, the official relations with the PAHO uh, ten years ago, there have been enormous advances in the development of kidney care in our countries. And uh, this collaboration had uh, a lot of advances, activities now to know the epidemiology and contributing factors for CKD, ensuring uh, access and CKD treatment, uh, human resources training, uh, and a lot of uh, things to, to do uh, in the next years. Uh, in the, we are planning in, with PAHO and uh, through PAHO with the ministers of health to consolidate the technical capacity of the national registries of patients in renal replacement therapy in the next three years and to consolidate the advances of renal replacement therapy coverage in our countries and uh, to develop uh, education strategies for training renal health in the first level of uh, attention. You know that uh, we were working very hard with PAHO in different courses, online courses, that uh, one of them uh, had been, uh, had reached uh, 35,000 uh, primary care physicians an enormous amount. Uh, we launched a course on AKI in the uh, first level of attention. And at this time, almost 4,000 primary care physicians attended this course. Really, uh, we will never been able to reach uh, that amount of, of people, of primary care physicians and nurses uh, on our own. And in the other side, uh, we have to, to work very hard 
in limiting the health impact of COVID-19 in our population with uh, acute kidney injury and also with uh, chronic kidney disease. You know that the impact of COVID is not only uh, related to the short period where the illness is uh, going on and also with an enormous impact over uh, the, the, the health system and the determinants of the uh, relation between health and uh, uh, illness. So we have to work with, with in conclusion with the ministers of health to, to fight against uh, these uh, impacts. Thank you, Alejandro. A very short question for you, Agnes. Vicente Sanchez Polo from Guatemala ask if the application for the ambassadors program is open all the year. Yes, but we don't do them on a running basis. So this is open all the year. So you can find the information specifically on the website. It has been paused due to COVID-19. For obvious reasons, we can't support travel, but we're hoping that in the future when travel is possible, that this will be one of the programs that will be able to open up again. But it, it's not that, a time during the year. It happens according to the needs and the availability of the person who will be the ambassador and the requesting unit that wants the help. And then another question from Central America, from Manuel Cerdas from Costa Rica. And it's a question for you, Agnes. The question is, how can we, um, can we have electronic microscopy in Central America and Caribe? It's a difficult question for you, I can imagine. How can you have that? Yes. Good question. Yeah. Well, it's expensive. And not only is the instrument expensive, but the technical person to prepare the specimens for electron microscopy has training and expertise beyond what a usual histotechnician would have. So I don't think that it's reasonable, as I alluded to before, that every center would have an electron microscope, an electron microscopist technician there. I think we know that Adequate diagnosis can be made in many cases from light microscopy and immunofluorescence. I think if you don't have immunofluorescence, then you are quite limited in making specific disease diagnosis. Beautiful studies by Mark Haas showed that you miss maybe 15 to 20% of specific diagnosis opportunity and native kidney biopsies if you forego electron microscopy. But we don't know ahead of time which ones those are. For some diseases, we're beginning to develop other markers. A very good example is fibrillary glomerulonephritis where immunohistochemistry for DNA JB9 now could be a substitute. The problem is that to suspect fibrillary glomerulonephritis, usually it is from seeing the fibrils on EM. So you have to be quite astute to recognize the smudgy IF pattern to think about it. And it's not economical to do DNA JB9 staining on every biopsy. Those are just some technical details. So I think we cannot have electron microscopy in every center. There are not enough resources uh, and expertise to do that. But I think that we should have the ability to do EM within regions on selected cases. And I think, uh, I'm sure Vivek can speak in much more detail to it, but I know from my couple of visits to India that some centers have light microscopy that can be improved, are working on immunofluorescence that can be improved and don't have electron microscopy. And then there are other centers that are state of the heart and have equipment capacity and volume that rivals anything in the most highly developed countries in the world. And it would make sense that those centers with less resource, less training would focus on doing excellent light microscopy immunofluorescence and on selected cases send EM to a regional center for interpretation. How we're gonna pay for it is another question, but the practical arrangement one can envision. With limited costs, if you can't even pay for basic medication for treatment of disease, it's hard to justify 
the cost for electron microscopy. So we need better funding mechanisms. We need to have health ministries and governments understand that putting money into screening and proper diagnosis saves a lot of money for earlier treatment, better intervention, and a better outcome for patients. Well, thank you very much. We are at the end then of this uh, exchange session. Thank you very much for your generous participation. And uh, then we move on, it seems to me, we move on to Cordoba. Greetings, my name is Agnes Fogg. I'm the current president of the ISN, and I'm very pleased to have the honor of presenting the Pioneer Award. As you know, the ISN is a global professional association dedicated to advancing worldwide kidney health. We bridge the gaps of available care, build capacity and connect our communities. And we now have over 30,000 members in over 160 countries, many of them within the region of SLAM. The ISN Pioneer Awards started in 2013. These recognize pioneers in nephrology in their own region and country. The winners of the Pioneer Award play a vital role in the development of nephrology. Some of them may be little known outside their own region, and the ones who win these prestigious awards have made a career-long commitment to nephrology development in their region. What we know is that without the 2021 ISN pioneers, nephrology in their parts of the world would be very different. One pioneer award in each eligible ISN region occurs every two years. There's a multi-step selection process with recommendations from regional boards and core program committees. Then the ISN executive committee makes a decision and then the ISN council approves of that decision. These people will no longer be unsung heroes. They will be honored at the World Congress Nephrology 2021 on the ISN website and via ISN communication channels. And I am very, very pleased to announce the person whom we are honoring here today. Pablo Ulysses Massari from Argentina. Congratulations on being the 2021 ISN Pioneer Award winner from Latin America. Good evening. Uh, and many, many thanks to Agne Fogo for this presentation and Dr. Vivek Cha, the past president of the International Society of Nephrology and Dr. Alejandro Ferreiro for the opportunity to present the winner of the Pioneer Award in 2021, Dr. Pablo Massari. Pablo, para mí es un honor realmente una satisfacción eh, ser partícipe de esta entrega, de este reconocimiento que para nosotros es eh, algo muy, muy especial. Les cuento a toda la audiencia que el doctor Pablo Masari es un médico científico eh, que ha hecho mucho por la nefrología latinoamericana en el ámbito de la atención eh, por, en excelencia de los pacientes en el ámbito de la investigación y la docencia, el cual nosotros hoy tenemos la oportunidad de, de reconocer. Pablo es un, es un miembro del interior, del interior de nuestro país, de la República Argentina, ha nacido en la provincia de Córdoba, en una pequeña ciudad, pueblito, llamado Cruz del Eje, ese, y donde cursó sus primeros estudios escolares y luego se dirigió a la, a la ciudad de Córdoba, donde cursó sus estudios de grado de, y, y obtuvo el título de médico allá por los, eh, a principios de la década del 70 en la Universidad Nacional de Córdoba. Eh, Pablo posteriormente cursó e hizo su fellow en, en medicina interna en el hospital privado universitario de Córdoba entre los años 70 a 1975 y posteriormente se dirigió a Estados Unidos. Allí Pablo... Eh, fue fellow del de servicio de nefrología, la división de nefrología, eh, bajo la tutela del doctor John eh, Weller, 
en Ann Arbor, en Michigan. Fueron años seguramente muy fructíferos para su aprendizaje, también con una pasantía en la Mayo Clinic de Rochester por el año 1976. Pero Pablo tenía mucho por hacer por nuestro país y por Latinoamérica, por lo tanto, rápidamente se regresó a nuestro país y ya se instaló en lo que fue su segunda casa, que fue el Hospital Privado de Córdoba. Allá, por, eh, por los finales de la década del 70, eh, Pablo, este, después de pasar por, por los Estados Unidos, se establece en el hospital privado y eh, desarrolló una amplísima actividad, tanto médica como en la parte docente y de investigación. Fue jefe del Departamento de Medicina Interna, eh, Pablo fue... Eh, eh, también jefe del servicio de nefrología, miembro del servicio de nefrología primero y luego durante más de 20 años, casi 30 años, jefe del servicio de nefrología del hospital privado. Eh, también eh, fue eh, en su actividad docente, director de la carrera de posgrado de nefrología en la Universidad Católica de Córdoba, profesor de medicina en la Universidad Católica de Córdoba, profesor de medicina interna, también en la Universidad de Cuyo, son las diferentes eh, universidades que tuvieron la oportunidad de, de recibir en sus claustros al, al doctor Pablo Masari. Eh, Pablo tuvo una amplísima este, participación en muchos ámbitos de la, de la vida académica y, de la, y, y del ámbito médico, fue miembro y eh, eh, director del programa de trasplantes del Hospital Privado de Córdoba durante muchísimos años, no solo fue miembro, sino fue el impulsor y prácticamente el creador de muchas de las áreas del trasplante, el cual fue casi su pasión y al que le puso todo el empeño. Podemos ver parte del, del servicio de nefrología en los diferentes años que han eh, eh, transcurrido con el doctor Pablo Mazari, hemos tenido diferentes cursos, actividades docentes de, de distinto tipo, ilustres visitantes eh, en distintos momentos de nuestra vida académica. Y no solo se conformó con eso Pablo, también su vida académica científica lo llevó a incursionar por las sociedades de nefrología. Fue presidente de la Sociedad Argentina de Nefrología entre los años 1992 y 1994, fue presidente de la Sociedad Latinoamericana de Nefrología entre el año 96 y el año 1999 y fue uno de los miembros fundacionales y posteriormente presidente de la Sociedad Argentina de Trasplante, al cual también lo llevó eh, a trabajar con mucha pasión. Eh, como tal, fue, eh, formó parte de distintos comités y, y, y comisiones organizadoras de, de eventos científicos de distintos tipos. Podemos ver en estas imágenes la gran cantidad de profesionales que no solo fueron colegas suyos, sino entrañables amigos, que seguramente este, lo, lo recuerdan a él con, con, con mucho afecto. Eh, podemos ver imágenes de, de, de muchos de los amigos que han participado eh, en la vida académica junto con, con Pablo. Eh, no solo eso, sino que cuando eh, eh, fue presidente de la Sociedad Latinoamericana, eh, fue parte del comité organizador y, y trajo a Argentina un gran congreso que tuvimos de la Sociedad Internacional de Nefrología, como fue el, el decimoquinto congreso de la International Society of Nephrology en el año 1999 en Buenos Aires, eh, con el, la presidencia de, del doctor Kiyoshi Kurokawa de Japón en aquella oportunidad. Fue un congreso que aún hoy recordamos mucho por esta parte del mundo con, con, con muchísimo afecto. Eh, Pablo fue miembro muy activo y participante de la Sociedad Internacional de Nefrología, al cual también gran parte de su carrera le ha dedicado como miembro eh, de comités, por ejemplo, CONGAM, es uno de los comités que más entusiastamente ha recibido en sus brazos a, a Pablo, fue miembro de CONGAM y después fue chairman eh, para, eh, de, eh, y vice-chairman y chairman y fue parte del, del consejo directivo también como consejero de la Sociedad Internacional de Nefrología, entre otros cargos que ha tenido en distintos comités. No solo eso, no solo de la parte científica ha vivido Pablo, ha tenido unas pasiones que a nosotros nos, nos ha hecho que lo admiremos mucho. Una de ellas es eh, la lectura. Pablo es un eximio lector eh, con una gran pasión por la historia de la medicina, 
Pablo se inclinó, siempre nos habló en cada una de, de, sus, de sus conversaciones de la gran pasión que tiene por la, por la historia de la medicina. No solo eso, sino que la literatura en general ha sido algo, un ámbito que él siempre lo ha apasionado, tal es así que casi le diría que un hito en su vida ha sido este, ten, eh, estar charlando largo tiempo con uh, uno de los escritores más eh, conocidos y que ha marcado la literatura mundial y es latinoamericano y colombiano y ha estado con Pablo, que es este, Gabriel García Márquez, premio Nobel de Literatura eh, ya hace unos años atrás. Pablo es un apasionado de la filatelia. Al día de hoy, yo creo que su casa debe estar este, empapelada de, 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 de sus estampillas, lo hace con mucha pasión y eh, este, lo, le ha dedicado muchísimo tiempo, mucho esfuerzo a, 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 a esta gran este, colección que tiene y que sigue siendo parte importante de, de su vida. Y tal vez la gran pasión de él es su familia, Parte de ellos lo tenemos este, presentes aquí acompañándolo. Cecilia, su compañera de vida, sus hijos, eh, que lo acompañan permanentemente. Eh, acá tenemos algunas imágenes de sus hijos, sus nietos, eh, sus hijos políticos, a los cuales eh, voy a nombrar con mucho cariño a Cecilia y sus hijas, Caro, Ale, Agustina, a sus hijos Pablo, Laura y Nico, y a sus nietos, algunos están aquí, otros un poquito más lejos, pero seguramente los tiene a todos cerca suyo en su corazón, Julieta, Marco, Tommy y Vito. Este, esta última foto es de, de otro de sus lugares en el mundo, que es su casita en las sierras de Córdoba, donde ya nos ha invitado más de una vez a compartir este, alguna jornada con él y donde este, pasa gran parte del tiempo con, con sus seres queridos. Así que Pablo... En particular, eh, y para finalizar este, esta presentación, yo quiero decir que esto es para mí, no solo es emocionante, gratificante, sino que eh, yo voy a estar eternamente agradecido porque gran parte de mi carrera ha sido marcada por lo, <coughs> lo que ha hecho por mí desde el principio de la misma. No solo abrirme las puertas en el hospital privado, sino eh, hacerme partícipe de la posibilidad de, de, de mi formación en Europa y el regreso luego al, al, a, al hospital privado. Por lo tanto, para mí no solo es un, un gusto eh, hacer esta presentación, sino que es eh, un honor y una gran emoción eh, que me embarga. Así que Pablo... Voy a hacer entrega en nombre de la Sociedad Internacional de Nefrología y en nombre de la Sociedad Latinoamericana de Nefrología, que también agradecemos uh, habernos permitido realizar este acto en este ámbito. Voy a entregar la placa. Gracias, gracias. gracias Walter. Y esta es también un recuerdo de la Sociedad Latinoamericana de Nefrología, a la trayectoria de alguien que fue presidente de, de nuestra sociedad. Muchas gracias. Acá si quiere. Wow. Estaba hablando de mí o de otra persona. <risa> Estaba hablando de... Este, bueno, uh, first of all, let me thank you. Uh, to the people of the ISN, Dr. Agnes Fogo, current president, and Dr. Rebecca Ja, former president of the International Society of Nephrology. Thank you for this award. Thank you for joining this session. And thank you for giving your time for this so far away meeting in Latin America. It's time to me now to thank the ISN. Dr. Fogo went truly through all the uh, advantages of the society, which in my, in my opinion is one of the best professional societies in the world. Academic based, science based, but practical medicine oriented. Uh, it's a society that has grown a lot and it's given a lot of, lot of are good things to people everywhere. The aim of the ASN, which is uh, to have a uh, good renal health for everybody everywhere, is being uh, reaching every year. 
Uh, particularly, at the, at the bottom of the slide, you see three names which uh, I have been associated, as Walter said, COMGAM, the Commission for the Global Advancement of Nephrology, under the direction of uh, John Dirks, KDGO, an archive, a repository of the what to do things in patients with renal disease. And lastly, and jointly with the International Society of Transplantation, I've been working in the Istanbul Commission, which is a ethical and theoretical commission taking care of the transplant business everywhere. There is no such other professional society <clears throat> with so many duties and also being successful. So I can't help saying I'm happy and proud and a privilege to receive this award. But we are not parachuting here all of the sudden. We've been trained in several other centers as a group. I have been always practicing hospital and academic medicine. And that is a teamwork. So Walter also mentioned the, uh, my institutions from the University Nacional de Córdoba to the uh, Universidad Católica de Córdoba and the Universidad Católica de San Luis. And of course, my alma mater, the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor, Michigan, back in the 70s. But then, when we, after we came back from, from Michigan, we decided to have a group of experts. Nephrology at that time was also already a, a specialty which had been divided and growing in several areas. So we sent Javier de Arteaga to the Hospital Eduard Herriot in Lyon, Francia. Y él vino de allí como un experto en diálisis y diálisis peritoneal, que todavía lo es y quizás uno de los expertos latinoamericanos más importantes en esa área. Then we needed a pediatric nephrologist. And we sent Isalda Kout to the uh, clinic of Erlangen and then Heidelberg in Alemania. And after she came back, she joined the ranks of the Hospital Privado and set a very nice nephrology pediatric unit. She has just retired and we are looking for a new <laughs> pediatric nephrology. Uh, then, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, the problems of bone and mineral metabolism in patients with renal disease was becoming a real problem. And we had the luck to, um, to uh, hire Walter Dotat, who was sent to the uh, Unidad de Metabolismo Ocio y Mineral del Hospital Central de Asturias, in Oviedo, bajo el liderazgo de Jorge Canata. Con esa unidad, hemos tenido proyectos de investigación y publicaciones en común que nos han ayudado mucho, nos han enseñado y nos han dejado un experto en el tema que ahora es este, escalando las, este, las áreas de la sociedad internacional y dando su experiencia allí. Y por último, como los argentinos somos 50% italianos, era cuestión de tiempo que hiciéramos un contacto con lo que es quizás... <coughs> La más espectacular unidad renal en Italia, el Hospital Riuniti de Bergamo, bajo la dirección del profesor Beppe Ramuzzi, a donde mandamos a Carlos Churchu, que se quedó allí como cuatro o cinco años y volvió convertido en un clinical scientist y quizás uno de los valores más importantes que tiene la nefrología argentina hoy en día. Pero antes que nada, gracias, gracias a los más de 50 residentes, fellows y tesistas 
que hemos ayudado a formar en estos 30 años, por lo mucho que hemos aprendido de todos ellos. Desparramados por todo el país y por Latinoamérica, son todos exitosos y llevan nuestro nombre al corazón y a los riñones de la gente. Muchas gracias. Jorge. Gracias. Javier. Pueden venir, por favor. Muy emocionante esta ceremonia. No sé si me puedes oír, Pablo. Eh, sí, eh, Pablo, Juan Fernández. Eh, Juan, Fernández. Ah, Juan, ¿dónde Habla? está Juan? Juan Fernández. <risa> es un gran placer eh, reencontrarme contigo. Hacía años que no nos comunicábamos. Pablo fue mi mentor en la sociedad latinoamericana. Pablo fue quien me introdujo por primera vez al compromiso con la nefrología latinoamericana. Y finalmente fue quien me propuso como presidente de la sociedad. Así que tengo muchísimo que agradecerte, Pablo, porque me diste la posibilidad de sumergirme en esta pasión que es el compromiso académico con toda la región. Eh, mis mayores felicitaciones, tienes muy merecido este premio. Tú y la nefrología de Córdoba y la de nefrología de Argentina y la nefrología latinoamericana que tú muy bien representas. Eh, me corresponde a mí cerrar esta sesión que para mí eh, es un privilegio realmente, primero por ser tú quien recibe el premio y segundo por haber eh, moderado esta, esta mesa plenaria, esta sesión plenaria tan distinguida con eh, participantes, con speakers de la calidad que han sido eh, Vivek Agnes y Alejandro. Entonces, eh, mi saludo para Pablo, mi saludo para todos los que fueron protagonistas en esta sesión. Un abrazo a Walter, con quien hemos compartido muchas actividades de compromiso regional. Mis saludos a todos los que participaron eh, en, esta, en esta sesión a todos los que atendieron y a los que hicieron preguntas. Algunas preguntas no fueron leídas en la sesión, pero pienso que tendrán oportunidad de enviárselas directamente a eh, los eh, invitados de la sesión. Eh, un abrazo, Javier, que hace mucho que no nos veíamos. También es un placer. Hemos tenido también instancias en común. Así que, eh, bueno, creo que es un orgullo para la sociedad internacional y la sociedad latinoamericana, terminar esta sesión en Córdoba, que es un eje de la nefrología latinoamericana. Un abrazo para todos y espero que nos podamos ver eh, personalmente en el futuro, en, en Panamá, en Córdoba, o donde sea, vernos mirando los ojos y seguir en nuestro compromiso con la nefrología. Un abrazo a todos y al el comité de control de esta actividad pueden disponer entonces de los próximos minutos. No sé Juan, si Pablo o Walter quieren decir algo. Dos palabras, Juan. Muchas sí, gracias. Muchas gracias. La gente de Montevideo siempre han sido, han estado siempre muy cerca nuestro este, y esto lo demuestra. Además, quiero agradecer a Alejandro, el presidente de la Sociedad Latinoamericana, Uh, por su apoyo y por la organización de este congreso en tiempos tan difíciles y quiero mandar un fuerte deseo de buena suerte y de apoyo para el doctor Álvarez de Santo Domingo que asumirá, creo yo, sí. la, la presidencia. ¿no? Sí, sí. Ale, Guillermo muchas gracias. Guillermo Álvarez. Saludos, Juan. Sa Saludos.
Ale, y nos veremos en Córdoba 2023. ¿Eh? Ese sí ya va a ser presencial, así que eh, estamos ya, están Oops, todos sí. invitados para dentro de dos años a nuestro Congreso Latinoamericano aquí en Córdoba. Un abrazo Bien, grande. Nos vemos. Nos vemos. Hijos.